Good afternoon. My name is Whitney Witt, and I'm the inaugural dean of the College of Health at Lehigh University. I am so excited to welcome you to the first in our ongoing Population Health Colloquium series. The Population Health Colloquium is a faculty organized series that will continue throughout the summer and focus specifically on COVID-19, examining most the most vulnerable populations, the social determinants of health, and really shining a light on the longstanding health inequities that we see. I'm very delighted to introduce you to four leading experts who will be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on uh, women, children, and families. Um, before we kick off the webinar, I'd like to do some brief introductions of my esteemed colleagues and today's panelists. So going in the order of presentation, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Deborah klein Walker, who is currently an adjunct professor at the Boston University School of Public Health and uh, the Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Walker is a public health researcher and leader with over 40 years of experience developing and implementing programs and systems change, research, evaluation, policy analysis, and consulting on a broad range of public policy issues across the lifespan. Next, I'm very happy to introduce Kate Johnson. Ms. Johnson has been recognized for her exemplary work in maternal and child health policy as a researcher, advocate, and consultant. Uh, Ms. Johnson is the president of the Johnson Consulting Group, and she is a leader in federal and state Medicaid and health policy programs since 1984, and has been an advisor to uh, more than 40 states in the United States. Uh, I'm very delighted to introduce Dr. Deb Deborah Allen. Dr. Allen is the Deputy Director in the Health Promotion Bureau of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Dr. Allen has been fighting for social justice, reproductive rights, and support for children with special health care needs for many years. Most recently, she led the Bureau of Child, Adolescent, and Family Health at the Boston uh, Public Health Commission. Finally, we are thrilled to welcome Nancy Kobogo. She is the Vice uh, President of the Board for the National Family Voices Organization. In addition, she is the co-direct Executive Director for Family Voices of the state or affiliate organization called PATH, Parent to Parent Family Voices of Connecticut, uh, where she leads a statewide parent support network for families of children with special health care needs. We will have uh, about 15 to 20 minutes uh, for panel and audience discussion today. So please use the Q&A feature uh, to send your comments and questions. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Walker, who uh, will kick off the webinar. Dr. Walker. Yeah. Uh, first slide. Okay. All right. It's wonderful to be here. I want to congratulate Whitney on inviting us to do this whole colloquium on the impact of COVID on women, children, and families. There have been very few of these at the broader level, although there's many, many webinars that are occurring. Before our panelists begin, I wanted to just say a couple things. This is not new to MCHers. We have dealt with disasters and epidemics over the last 30 years. It is true that this is the biggest one and the most complicated we've ever dealt with, but we've had natural weather events. We've had disease outbreaks and epidemics before. We did a lot with HIV AIDS, SARS, most recently with Zika. And finally, we've done a lot related to the disasters which are caused by domestic and foreign terrorists like the 9-11 attack and the anthrax attacks. Next slide. In all of these disasters and epi epidemics, next slide, okay. I just wanted to say a few things high level. MCH agencies and staff have always led to protect mothers, children, and families in all of their responses. They provide a full spectrum of services from prevention to intervention, follow-up and support. They've activated MCH networks and access to broad range of MCH experts at every level of government. They've provided needed expertise on women, families, children and youth, including those with kids with special health care needs. 
They have linked all those efforts to the Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant infrastructure in states and local health departments. And finally, they've done this always keeping an equity focus in all aspects of responding because we know the most vulnerable, the poorest, those who are already suffering from the effects of racism are often the worst that have been affected by these disasters. So having said that, our panel is going to start with Kay Johnson, and she's going to give more of a high-level policy uh, approach to all of the impacts with a special focus on access to Medicaid. Then that will be followed by uh, Deborah Allen, who is on the line right now every day on the ground in, in LA, and she'll talk about what they're doing and, and what are the key things that are, are happening as they impact on families and kids. And finally, we're going to end up with a family perspective from Nanfi, and she will talk about it from the point of view of families and how they are reacting and what are the kinds of services and supports they need. So next, I'll turn it to Kay. Thank you so much, Deborah and Whitney. It's really an honor to be here, and I apologize. My dog has just decided this is the moment to whine, perhaps because she hears my voice. I really am uh, very delighted to focus us a little bit on policy opportunities. Next slide, please. We really have been thinking a lot about um, the, the whole situation for families and what's facing the maternal and child health populations, of women, uh, children, uh, adolescents, and um, the, their families overall. And first and foremost, I think we're all thinking about whether policy action will be sufficient to meet families' needs in the crisis. The families need basic support for, for uh, things like income, food and housing and concrete needs for supplies. They also need health coverage and access to services, childcare and education services, social services and safety in their homes and their communities. We know that many need protection from unequal treatment and bias in the healthcare system, as well as the compounding impact of disparities and racism. Next slide, please. I just wanted to start with, this is a framework that we developed as part of the infant mortality coin that I've modified a little bit for today that really puts that social determinants of frame on it. And when I was thinking about this over the weekend, one of the things that I realized is that this frame is the overlay for the response we need for families and MCH populations. And so if you look at those gray domains about living conditions and social support, safety, well-being, food, uh, health access, unequal treatment, racism, education, employment, and income. And each of those has a, has a correlate out in those blue elements. And we're thinking very broadly about what are the social determinants of health and what are the, the factors that matter in terms of equity. The COVID crisis has brought all of these to the fore. Next slide, please. The other thing I think many of us have been thinking about is what is the crisis brought? What is the partial response we have through some policies today and what would a full response look like? So again, we've got these disparities compounding, families under a lot of stress, either because they're, they're at home and cloistered with their children under circumstances that are also stressful or because they've lost their job um, or their income otherwise. The children are missing health care appointments or pregnant women are not having access to the maternity care that they leave. The American Academy of Pediatrics is sounding the alarm about immunizations. We're worried about those women in the postpartum period, but we're worried that families don't have food, kids aren't going to school, that maybe this is leading to an increase of substance use. And the partial response We've got a little bit of data coming in on disparities, some home visits being done virtually, a little effort um, in this initial period to try to get people some money to cover their bills. Um, the, the, we've got some virtual healthcare visits going on, but there are payment problems in a lot of states. Medicaid providers did not get their funding relief that Medicare providers got and so on. A full response would look like vigorous monitoring of unequal treatment. It would look like a robust set of family support programs that would include home visiting, but much more. It would include check-ins for families with new babies. It would include check-ins for families of children with special health care needs. It would include income support until the end of the crisis, not for eight weeks uh, or not one $1,200 check. 
It would include vigorous support for public health and maternal and child health programs directly through the state and local agencies that are at the front line of this response, as we're going to hear from Debbie. And it would have Medicaid functioning for states, for providers, and for patients, and so on. Next slide, please. What does it mean, really, to think about the whole crisis in the context of MCH? Because um, while these are emergencies and they're disrupting just daily life for everyone, um, it's sometimes not really the focus to think about the MCH populations. But particularly, I think for many of us, we know that pregnant women and infants have unique health concerns. We have people of color, people with disabilities, and people in poverty are being more affected by this. Um, is disrupting an array of health services from birth facilities to primary care, from contraception to mental health, and everything in between. Our public health agencies are stressed, and maternal and child health programs are not necessarily at the top of that big picture. Uh, we've got a primary care crisis with providers saying they may not be able to stay in business, and we have children being 40% uh, covered by Medicaid and 15% of women of childbearing age using Medicaid and yet Medicaid serving all these other purposes at the moment. Next slide, please. In the new law, the last one, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, we had a Medicaid policy enacted in March 19th. This is actually the, the second round. Um, and it did a number of things, but a lot of it was around testing. And a lot of it was around things that would only be in place for, quote, the duration of the COVID-19 emergency. They got a temporary increase um, in federal matching rate for states that require states to maintain their efforts and so on. But it's really a sort of minimal response to the pressure that's being put on our healthcare system. Next slide, please. So what would a more vigorous response look? States can rapidly adjust their rules. Uh, so they could temporarily make all the uninsured eligible um, or all of the uninsured with a diagnosis of COVID-19. They, they can continue eligibility without interruption for everybody who's currently and newly enrolled. And in order to get that enhanced federal match, they have to promise to do that. They could streamline eligibility determinations. Don't make anyone go face to face. Let them do it online. Let them have offsite enrollment and so forth. Next slide, please. There are also remedies in Medicaid about payment and benefits. Um, one of the biggest hurdles has been getting Medicaid to pay for telehealth services um, at the standard visit rate. Some states have done it, some states have it, some states have done it for some providers and so on. We think expanding financing for virtual services by nurses, midwives, doulas, home visitors, community health workers, and others is all possible rapidly in Medicaid, but not necessarily happening. Having more payments go for home and community-based care, financial support to the family caregivers of people with disabilities or long-term care, and our children with special health care needs who maybe can't have an external caregiver in at this time because it's too risky. And again, waiving some of the rules um, to get all of the testing and the treatment uh, covered for COVID-19. Next slide, please. We as a group and uh, Deborah Klein Walker and Debbie Allen um, and Family Voices have all been a partner in this that we are calling for $1.5 billion in federal relief uh, for the Title V maternal and child health programs for them to help respond to the pandemic, to do the kind of prenatal and postpartum services, immunizations and well child visits. What if we get our schools open and they don't have health and mental health advisors or our childcare centers? Visiting families with new babies, not a whole home visiting program, just a check-in. And for those families with children with special health care needs, we've got a whole group of adolescents and young adults cloistered at home, not getting their de developmental tasks or their school done, and they have physical and mental health needs that need to be addressed. Supporting our family to family and other resource centers. Having epidemiologists who are doing surveillance who really understand how to do surveillance in maternal and child health, and that whole array of programs that state MCH programs are operating that include home visiting and WIC and, and family planning and school health and newborn screening and so on. Next slide, please. 
So just to say there are a lot of advocacy considerations here from my point of view. Are we gonna effectively use the window of opportunity that we have? Will we get a lot of money for home visitors and childcare workers and not enough money for pediatricians and OBGYNs? Are these rules and restrictions that are protected individuals gonna be restored after the crisis? I'm very worried also that the Trump administration will prematurely call an end to the national emergency and all of these protections that Congress enacted will go away. And I think all of us are concerned about the budget cuts that Congress or state legislatures might enact because of the budget crisis COVID is creating. Next slide, please. So I would just say that um, if you don't know this quote from Grace Abbott, I'm in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but she talked about all the agencies of the federal government and how her role at the Children's Bureau, um, as she saw uh, limousines and tractors and tanks, and she imagined all the other agencies having these conveyances in the streets and said, because the responsibility is mine and I must, I take a very firm hold on the handles of the baby carriage and I wheel it into the traffic. And pushing forward for maternal and child health populations is going to be this kind of situation in the COVID crisis. So with that, I turn it back. Next slide, please. Um, okay, thank you, Kay, for that great overview uh, and that wonderful uh, spot about uh, our leaders in maternal and child health. Uh, what I would like to do is make sure that people are, are putting questions into the question and answer box uh, so we will have a robust discussion later on. And next, I'm going to turn it on to Deborah Allen, who's worked at both the state and the uh, local level in epidemics and pandemics. She was actually very instrumental in addressing the AIDS epidemic as it related to pregnant women and kids and a real supporter of those programs with Ryan White. But today she's in LA County, one of our largest counties leading the efforts there. So we're happy to hear from you, Debbie. Take it away. So much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you all. I, I must say, I, 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 there are many leaders of the efforts in LA County. It is not one of the largest counties. It is the largest county uh, with over 10 million people. And the, the, the image you're seeing here is a, a map of the county. Um, uh, and uh, it is intended to give you a sense of the enormous diversity, which is the great strength of the county, uh, of its population. Next slide. Um, I'm going to focus on, on three things. One is I, I know that my focus will be on maternal and child health, but because I think many people listening may not have a sense, I mean, there has been enormous and appropriate attention to the heroic roles played by frontline uh, medical care workers in addressing this epidemic. But because it tends to be less dramatic and it is generally less life and death, um, I think much less awareness about exactly what it is that public health has done. So I want to highlight that, um, including but not limited to maternal and child health, just so that all speakers go away from this with an understanding of the tremendous importance of funding for uh, public health in general in relation to situations like this. Then I wanna focus on what's gone on in relation to MCH in LA during this pandemic and then suggest some lessons for the future. Uh, next slide. Um, while looking at the next slide, I, I wanted to uh, just observe as a, a thought from the last uh, two speakers, from, from uh, Kate and, and Debbie Walker, um, that uh, coming away from the AIDS epidemic, um, while it uh, exacted a, an incredible and lasting toll on the gay population, it also was uh, uh, an inflection point in our history and enormous social progress around um, LGBTQ rights really had its, its impetus, its, its kick to move forward from that epidemic and the fault lines it revealed around inequality in our society. And I think the challenge for us is to say, how can this, this epidemic, this revelation of fault lines in society do the same um, for those who are um, at, at, in terms of class and race, uh, most suffering the hardships. Um, but coming back to my point about local public health, this is the, I'm sorry, org charts are inherently unexciting, but 
I wanted to uh, provide some context for my comments. So these are the, the um, bureaus of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, which is about 4,000 people. My bureau, the one I lead, is the Health Promotion Bureau. It's the one in blue. Um, yellow to my left is operations. Um, then health promotion is the green one. That's largely environmental health. And disease control, the orange one, is where you would think all the action would be around this epidemic. Um, it is, of course, at the center of our efforts around um, identifying cases, identifying um, contacts of those cases, doing contact tracing, trying to prevent spread in terms of high-risk sites uh, like skilled nursing facilities, intervening in those sites, training personnel in those sites, et cetera. But the fact is that the scale of this epidemic is such that there is no one in our organization who is not at least somewhat affected. And a good 50% of the 4,000 people who work here have had um, their time completely shifted over. I'm, I'm a sort of 75%, I would say, uh, working on epidemic related activities and 25% and trying to hang on to my um, my bureau and its efforts. Um, but I, I just wanted to give you a sense of sort of structure and, and the nature of the personnel who are getting involved in this work. So next slide um, is, this is just a list of the work groups at the local health department that are involved in doing work around the epidemic. So there's an operations group, which th that's the group that's doing that case finding following up on uh, persons who may be infected, but it's not clear following up on outbreaks to see if there's a, um, if spread in a particular facility is due to an index case, or if it just happens that there were a few cases uh, that occurred in a particular site. Um, public information is a huge endeavor. Um, so much of this, I mean, we don't have a vaccine, of course. There is no herd immunity, of course. So it's really public information that's our, our prevention arm um, because we've got to convince people that they should be socially distancing and wearing masks and washing their hands and so on. So uh, we, we are putting a huge effort into that and everything we do then gets translated into 13 languages. Um, there's a, a liaison section that includes staff who are dedicating their time to working with other sectors. I mean, just to give you one uh, small taste of that, um, uh, one person who works in my bureau and heads our child and adolescent health has become our lead for work with the education sector. So he works with early childhood, uh, early care and education with the public schools of which there are multiple systems in LA County. There are two very large ones, um, but lots of, of other school districts that are small and independent. And they are all grappling with how the heck are we going to be transporting, um, in the case of the Los Angeles Unified School District, literally hundreds of thousands of kids in school buses safely on a daily basis across this, uh, the, the areas that they serve in the county. How are we going to set up a high school program so that kids who on a normal school year would be going from class to class um, uh, can, because they take electives that are different from each other, how can we arrange a school day so that kids actually get the high school curriculum but are not running around the school in, you know, each infecting multiple other students if there's one who is sick? How do we create the financial support for class sizes that are cut in half or maybe in thirds to have people six feet apart in a classroom? So just, I mean, again, thinking of this list as a whole, there's one person leading a tiny team who's working with that enormous sector of our society, figuring out with them, how are they going to reopen safely? Um, there's a medical information unit that I am part of. Um, we're responsible for producing the guidance that goes to each of these sectors, as well as general information documents for the public as a whole. And uh, just to give you a, a feel for that, my, um, I mean, some of this has been personally quite fascinating because with each new guidance, I have to delve into something new. So just to give you a flavor for what's that, what that's like, as we're approaching reopening over the last week, I've been working on guidance for um, uh, houses of worship, 
uh, for drive-in movie theaters and for offices where there may be an outbreak. Um, previously, when we were um, in the um, you know earlier stages of the the epidemic, I was involved in in writing guidance around care of women who are pregnant around uh, coping with the death in your family, just the enormous diversity of the issues that are raised by the pandemic and the number of things on which people need information about their work lives, around, ab about managing um, this uh, infection when it comes into their homes and families, about dealing with the psychological impact and so on. Every single one of those can turn into um, a document, and then every time there's a change in our understanding of the epidemic, every one of those documents have to be updated. Um, and then we also have groups that are working on um, safety and on uh, planning, very broadly speaking, looking forward to it, that they, they are maintaining our statistics and uh, um, uh, allowing us to see trends um, so that we can plan into the future, which is clearly cl critical right now as we grapple with reopening and, and you know, with recognizing that reopening is inevitably a mix of um, what is needed in terms of protecting people's health and what is um, uh, really uh, required in terms of um, uh, sustaining people's economic survival. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a great deal, I mean, every single um, decision that gets made is a balancing of those two factors. Um, and then there's a, a small team that does modeling, working with the statistics we have about current trends, trying to understand how different population groups are being affected and uh, trying to assess what the consequences of, of different actions that we might take would be next. So, so that's, that's really my focus on, on public health in general. Um, oops, no, I forgot. I wanted to give you a picture of what that means in, in LA specifically. No, the next slide is right. I just realized this wasn't my last one on um, uh, the general situation in LA. So we are a huge county, so almost 50,000 positive cases. Um, 6,000 have been uh, hospitalized and we've had about 2,000 deaths, 93% of whom were people with underlying conditions. Um, and you see the race ethnicity distribution. What may not be clear is that um, uh, the African-American population, which is relatively small, it's a huge county. So, um, you know, the, if, if African-Americans are a little under 10%, um, and there are 10 million people, that means there are a million African-American people here. Um, so even though they are a smaller percentage than several other groups, um, they are a large population. And so uh, the 12, they, they are the group with, uh, uh, they have a, a, a disproportionate number of the deaths. Um, the, the age chart at the bottom, I think is interesting because um, you'll see that of cases, um, people talk about this as, as a disease that doesn't affect young people at all or significantly. In fact, um, the, the, plural, the large majority actually of cases um, are below um, uh, 65. I'm sorry, the last thing there should not say 41 to 65, it should say over 65. So over 65 year olds have been 19% of the cases um, but they are uh, well over half of the deaths, um, 15, uh, 1,500 out of about 2,000 deaths. Um, the majority of the cases are people younger than 65. 36% are under the age of, uh, rather 41% are under the age of 40 and 5% and, um, are zero to 17. So it is not an, a, a condition that doesn't affect young people. It's a condition that has not thus far uh, killed young people. Next slide. And, and, and with that, I will transition to um, talking about MCH. Next slide, please. yes. Um, so as that slide indicated, the primary impact of um, COVID-19 on the MCH populations in the county um, has, has not been the direct medical effect of COVID-19 affecting MCH groups. It has had medical impact, very importantly, um, as Kay was mentioning, in terms of missed care and particularly um, missed 
uh, uh, vaccination appointments, but also lost care for children with special health care needs. I mean, for example, we run a therapy program that serves children who are uh, uh, enrolled in public schools in LA that provides occupational therapy and physical therapy. And um, those, that, that program has had to shut down um, because of the epidemic and the school closure. A few, a few school systems have actually stayed partially open and we've been able to provide service to those kids. But um, a lot of concerns uh, about um, various kinds of mistherapies and mistreatments for kids with special needs. Um, and um, Nanfi may be, may be uh, wanting to mention that. And the other thing, of course, that's emerging um, is uh, the multisystem inflammatory syndrome that we're seeing emerging in New York. Um, we've seen some cases, I believe England was the first place that cases showed up. And in LA, um, this, this is actually a day old. Um, we now think it's 20 cases and that five were being um, misidentified. Um, but we are definitely seeing cases here, although thankfully uh, no deaths in LA County. Um, but very, very um, interested and concerned um, as this epidemic stays with us over a longer period about what, and, and you know, as we see um, the, the virus uh, mutating and changing about what that's going to mean for kids. And because, you know, I, I think we were getting a little complacent about um, the medical consequences for kids and thinking we had sort of dodged a bullet. Um, and uh, this has been a real shock to the system and a real reminder um, that, that these, uh, these epidemics take uh, a variety of forms and um, this is one we don't know, we're just getting to know it. Uh, so we should be ready for surprises. But overwhelmingly the impact on the MCH uh, population is going to be um, and has been in terms of social needs. Um, our home visiting programs, our case management programs um, have been operating uh, virtually for the most part. Um, we are particularly concerned um, that those programs and uh, in-hospital supports, uh, doula care and so on, I mean we, we have a major focus on addressing black-white inequality in birth outcomes. And based on an understanding of life course theory and the notion that stress and uh, social marginalization plays a big role in creating the, the, um, the health deficit associated with adverse birth outcomes, a major focus of that work, and I think not just in LA County, is on strategies aimed at providing support for women and it is precisely that support that has been most difficult to deliver uh, during the pandemic with hospitals, for example, um, allowing in some cases none and in some cases one support person to accompany a woman during delivery. Um, and it, but, but, you know, really the, the, the impediments to providing person to person support throughout the epidemic have taken a toll. And of course, we recognize um, that those, the lack of those supports uh, and, and all the challenges entailed in getting services and supports during the pandemic have taken a particular toll on low-income women, women of color, and their families. Next. Next slide, please. So I, I wanted to just take a minute to say what I think we've learned um, we need and what it will take to get there. Um, so, so one just very specific lesson of this uh, whole experience has been um, uh, the value of the ability. It's not perfect, um, but it is tremendously important to have systems that allow us to collect, to connect virtually. And one of those flaws in the system that has emerged sharply is the, the uh, electronic divide, the, the um, connection divide, and the number of families who lack um, either the equipment or they have uh, very limited access to data plans. Um, and so, you know, thinking about how that, um, that safety net, if you will, that electronic safety net um, has made a difference for some families. How do we equalize access to that? Um, 
The second thing I think has been, um, uh, Kate talked, I think, very usefully about um, the idea of partial solutions. And some of the staff of my bureau have spent um, heroic effort trying to get um, goods and services to families um, who uh, may be uh, quarantined or isolated um, uh, and have um, limited access and, and financially are too hard up um, to get diapers, baby wipes, baby therm thermometers. Um, and it has been, it has been fascinating watching and, and painful watching people move heaven and earth. I mean, one of our big campaigns was an, a, a million diaper campaign. Um, and it's not just the getting the diapers, getting the donor who will donate the diapers, but then figuring out where do you find a warehouse? And we're not in this business. Where do you find a warehouse where you can leave a million diapers? And who are the staff that are going to bundle them into packages that you can give to either an organization like a WIC program or an individual family. I mean, these are enormous logistical challenges. And the nature of, you know, the, the nature of entitlement in our society is so limited that, um, you know, people were completely dependent on charity, if you will, um, for something that every single family needs. Um, one of the things that we thought about as we tried to resolve this was whether it would be possible to sort of add on to WIC um, a, a second uh, card, if you will, not part of WIC, but paid for by another entity um, that would allow families to get um, diapers, baby wipes, thermometers, et cetera, all those other, you know, breastfeeding supplies, all those other things families need. And it turned out that that would be a huge logistical cha uh, challenge. Um, so we're still very much relying on this kind of ad hoc search for donations. Um, and uh, the, the, the need to jerry-rig a system uh, every time a, a completely predictable need arise, arises in a, a, a part of the population. A, a third lesson turning more to sort of a, a public health um, uh, policy um, uh, matter is just how relevant the skills of MCH people have proved to be as part of our response. Um, all of our staff um, uh, uh, have had much to contribute and many have brought their um, their person-to-person -person skills to great use as uh, contact tracers, as case interviewers, and so on. And then finally, I want to emphasize, um, I think, a missed point in this epidemic. And that's when we look at the statistics and at who has died, at the disproportionate number of people of color who have died, um, we really need to recognize that the health deficit that they bring when they encounter this disease started with deficits at birth, started in utero, started with the health of the mother even before the pregnancy. And if we want to come out of the next epidemic or the one after that with a, a, a healthy, um, a healthier, more equal result for the population as a whole, we need to be paying attention to the health of mothers and babies now. Um, that health de deficit is a lifetime deficit, not one that occurred the day before the virus struck. Um, and I will stop there and uh, turn to the next speaker. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, you really gave a really good picture of a public health response. And I, I want to just thank you and thank all the heroes in public health who are doing that every day. I, I don't think most people know. And I hope we come out of this with a better respect and resources for the whole public health structure at every level. Okay, next we're gonna hear from Nambi Lubogo, who's gonna talk from the perspective of kids and families with special healthcare needs. Nancy. Thank you, Debbie. And thank you, um, Deborah and Kay. And I'm gonna try and take what Deborah and Kay talked about and talk about the impact that it's had um, on um, families of children and youth with special healthcare needs. Next slide, please. So just to quickly give you an overview um, of where we got our data sets, um, um, I belong to a network um, that is a family to family health information center. Um, there's a family to family health information center um, in all the 50 states and um, family voices. Are, 
um, is available in about 43 states in the nation and Parent to Parent USA is available in about 38 states. So this is um, where we gathered all our data. Um, we've been getting together since COVID struck um, and talking to each other, networking with each other, and really trying to just get through as a network together. So if you, um, wherever you are in your states, um, if you're looking to connect with families, these are three great places that you can start. Next slide, please. And so um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the families from our uh, stories from our families and just letting you know that I myself am a parent of three. Um, I'm hunkered in my basement right now, homeschooling, distance learning, working, and taking care of the whole family. Um, my daughter, who's 20, almost 21 years old, has multiple special health care needs, including um, behavioral needs, which were really very difficult to handle right at right at the beginning um, of the pandemic. And um, so I'm speaking on a perspective of things that I've dealt with myself. I'm also a caregiver to my husband who has um, also complex medical needs. And we're also hunkered down with my in-laws who have a brand new baby. So um, as you can see, you know, the risk for us um, in my household, I had, um, and I was basically, I'm the one who's running the show. Um, we had a lot of people who could easily be compromised um, through COVID-19. So there was a lot of care that we had to take and that comes with um, a lot of sacrifice and a lot of planning and a lot of anxiety on myself because I would, if I went out and I got infected, I was potentially bringing this um, disease back into the, into the household. So some of the stories um, that we've been hearing from our families, um, and you know, Deborah and Kay had talked about um, some of these issues. One of them was the ability to get medical supplies. Um, a lot of us found, and my daughter herself uses a CPAP machine, and um, it was impossible to get um, supplies. If you had a child who used a trach and, or a ventilator, um, it was virtually impossible to, you know, everything was like on back order. Um, and most of the supplies were actually diverted to the hospital system who had to become creative because there was such a lack of um, supplies in the hospitals. And, um, you know, that obviously can take a toll on families, you know, having to reuse um, things that, you know, are not necessarily safe um, or some of them, unfortunately, having to go without medical supplies. Um, we had difficulty obtaining um, or affording extra refills as people were unemployed. The CDC guidelines were to get your, your prescriptions filled 30 days. Obviously, you know, if you can't afford, um, if you have paying out of pocket because you lost your health insurance, um, paying for 30 day supplies was difficult for many families. Um, and obviously some of these um, medications were um, restricted medications that would only allow you to get month to month. Um, so we found a lot of our families having to deal with issues like that. There was difficulty in finding affordable health insurance after loss of insurance-based um, um, insurance. And obviously, um, you know, states that did not have um, the privilege of ha being Medicaid expansion states um, didn't have access to Medicaid. Um, and even the ones that did have Medicaid expansion and were able to um, seek Medicaid for um, temporary Medicaid while they were unemployed or affected by COVID, there was not a lot of guidance. It was kind of all over the place in some, in, in many states, there was confusion about how to get it. And then also families didn't really know um, that they could even access Medicaid services. Um, and so, you know, all of us, the F2S family voices and parent to parents found ourselves having to be really creative in, in terms of, because many families rely on all these services or information from these services coming through either their social service organizations, their WIC programs, um, you know, two-on-one information centers, and many of them either were closed um, or extremely limited. It was virtually impossible to, to get on a call and ask anybody a question. And so um, I think all of our, our work volumes as family to families Family Voices and Parent Parents just went up by like 50% as what we became the navigators of all those different services. Um, and many of them that we are not even, you know, we've become experts as parents because we have to deal with them, but it's truly not our job to, you know, seek all these services and inform families. So we had to quickly become very creative, um, getting the information to families. Some um, 
there were some organizations like the Parent Friend in New Jersey that was using WhatsApp for their Spanish speaking families to try and get them the information. They would take a picture of something that they saw and you know put it in JPEG and send it via WhatsApp. So we had to like think outside the box for a lot of these, these different services to get the information to our families. But needless to say, um, you know, that was that has been a difficult process. Um, families faced out-of-pocket costs for non-covered services with dealing with loss of income and um, health insurance. There was a lot of problems that we had with telehealth, um, particularly in areas that had no broadband. Um, all of a sudden, people had to completely adjust to doing remote delivery of services. Um, and if you lived in an area that didn't have broadband, if you didn't have access to, you know, a computer that had, um, you know, a video screen, or if you don't, if you had limited, you know, cell phone service um, or limited cell phone minutes, it was virtually impossible. So a lot of our families ended up not being able to connect to their primary health providers. Um, and that was really difficult. Um, and some of them unfortunately went without, you know, they would opt to, you know, there was nothing they could do. They would try to connect, they couldn't connect. And unfortunately um, it led to, you know, missed, missed care that they could have gotten for their child. Um, things like physical therapy, not so easy to do, obviously when you're doing telehealth um, and stuff like that. And um, the Navajo Nation especially, was, um, you know, it was hit hard by COVID and hit especially hard um, because they had like no access to any broadband services or anything, access to telehealth, um, just because they lived remotely. Um, and that was the same in many underserved communities. Lack of interpretation services um, was also a challenge um, because many of our providers were working from home and, um, and so obviously didn't have interpretation services in different languages, um, interpretation for sign language, um, and that was just a little um, difficult. And then we also found that even our health providers were um, having a difficult time scaling up, you know, at, and quickly adjusting to um, telehealth services. Many of um, us had to do, you know, physicals or what have you, um, with a, on a conference call, sometimes the doctors were in the in their offices, but had to be on speaker, and there was difficulty hearing, and just a whole host of issues. Um, and I think Debbie had mentioned that that these are things that we have to think about, you know, and, and prepare to scale up now before the next pandemic hits. Um, distance learning um, was also um, very difficult and challenging for children with special health care needs who don't have access to their one-to-one -one services. Many of them struggled with other issues, behavioral issues, um, cognitive issues that just doing stuff virtually without the assistance um, of having an aid um, was difficult. And we found that many of them really started to lag behind um, compared to their peers. And, um, and then we also had families, um, you know, who now had to become speech and language pathologists, physical therapists, and, you know, um, caregivers for their children, you know, during this whole distance learning thing. And, you know, we had families who had, you know, um, if they had very, you know, education also came into it. Um, I think all the families across America were having a difficulty, were having difficulty becoming um, teachers. And those of us who've had to become special ed teachers have faced even more challenges um, trying to provide those services for our special health care needs um, children. Loss of home care services, um, such as skilled nursing or personal care attendance, um, respite services, or any other in-home services provided um, were difficult many times is because um, families, um, either people were afraid, our, you know, our PCAs were afraid of coming into our homes um, because, you know, our families were the more compromised families um, or vice versa. We didn't want people coming into our homes um, and, you know, inadvertently bringing um, the virus in with them. So there was, there was a, you know, the, many families um, went without nursing, skilled nursing or PCA. And so in addition to becoming, you know, special ed teachers and physical therapists and keeping your job and maintaining the family, they also had to become very quickly had to become, you know, pick up nursing and become the PCA and also um, respite services, you know, also um, were not available. So we found that, you know, many of us are just completely exhausted trying to balance all of these um, different aspects during this pandemic. 
um, behavioral health and men behavior and mental health problems. Obviously, there was an uptake in that um, because this pandemic just hit us all of a sudden. There was no time to plan, no time to put things in place. Um, and, you know, children and youth with special health care needs, you know, some of them had difficulty adjusting to new things. And so we saw that behavioral health and mental health problems went up. Um, and because there was a lack of structure, special education um, that, that had to be implemented, therapies, um, many of them were um, not available, and there was very little behavioral health support. Um, and, you know, that happened to my, my family. And, you know, we, we got to a point where we um, very, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had to, we were not able to access our mental health services, and we had to call um, 211 um, a crisis um, center to try and get outside help. When I finally got through after hours and hours of calling and was connected to somebody, the options that they gave me were really scary. Um, I just, um, at the end of the day, I opted to just ride the storm with my daughter. Um, and because I was afraid, um, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, it was virtually impossible to get into an ED. And if you did get into an ED, um, the situations there were just horrific. Um, and we'd seen stories on TV about people being, you know, put in beds um, in, you know, in the hallways. And I was just afraid that, you know, my daughter would be shipped somewhere where I wouldn't have access to her and that she wouldn't have access to us. And I didn't want her to be afraid. So we opted to just ride the storm with her. And it was a very, very difficult two weeks. Next slide, please. Um, and just like I was talking about, the stress in parents um, and children when parents are not allowed to visit their children in group homes, that we saw, you know, it becoming a little bit better as, as the pandemic, as, as, you know, as we continued into the pandemic, because people started to advocate to try and see if they could at least have allow one parent to be at a bedside, you know, completely gowned up. Um, but that varied, and you know, in different states and in different hospitals. Some hospitals had extremely strict policies where nobody was allowed to visit, period. Um, and that was very difficult on families. So we, you know, we saw many families like mine who opted, um, you know, not to. And some of those, those issues were, you know, some of them ended up being very complicated um, and it, it could end up being devastating. Fortunately, we didn't hear of any um, deaths as a, re as a result of being afraid to take your child. Um, you know, for care about, you know, many families really dealt with difficult issues. Um, our families also felt, um, dealt with a lot of stress, extra cost of caring for children who were brought home from group home settings. All of a sudden now you're, you're the, you, you know, you're, you, you're, you're the one controlling everything and managing everything. Um, things like food stamps, you know, have more people in your home. Um, you know, some families still had to go into the group home setting, but just the, co the cost of the extra cost of having children um, home 24 seven. And again, our F2Fs were very creative in, in, in looking to communities and trying to find places where um, families could get access to food. Um, and I'm being told that I, I need to wrap up. So I'm going to just um, jump to my last bullet here, talking about the grief concerns um, among parents, especially single parents who had to, were well, the sole carers of their child and the stresses that they had to um, deal with if they needed to be hospitalized. So next slide, please. Um, just really quickly, we had, we saw an uptake on housing. Uh, many families were evicted due, due to unemployment. Housing issues are tough. They're tougher even during a pandemic. The deaf and hard of hearing population um, suffered because of um, communication issues. Face masks are, you know, mask and cover our mouths so that they didn't have access to, they couldn't understand what we we're saying if we're completely faced up or masked up. Um, there was lack of interpretation services. Again, I said, um, you know, the Navajo Nation and other communities of color um, have been really, really hit um, by this pandemic. Um, more than any of all the families. And next slide, please. So I just wanted to wrap this up. I'm sorry, I had to zoom through those slides really quickly. Um, this, this, the story of Ishan here was shared with everybody. Um, and it was a, it's a really moving story, which I encourage you to um, read if you get some time. Um, and it was shared by the parent parent of Georgia. 
Um, and this is an immigrant family that was dealing um, with COVID-19 as an immigrant family, balancing the work, um, work and care of an 18-year-old who has multiple um, physical and dis developmental um, disabilities. There was a lot of guilt that they carried um, as they talked to their other families outside of the country um, in, in different times to be able to fly over and take care of them or bring a, a sick family into their home, but they couldn't because they didn't want to compromise their son. Um, and, you know, Ishan's family faced a lot of stigma that was, has been directed to immigrants, um, you know, especially Asian American families um, who were affected because of the way COVID-19 was expressed by some people. So I encourage you to please read Ishan's story um, if you can. It's really powerful and it's really moving. Um, and with that, I will hand it back to Debbie. Okay, thank you so much, Nanfi. It was wonderful to have you talk from your own personal experience, but that from many, many families whom I know you serve and represent. I just wanna say something to the audience that may not know. Just as there are public health departments in all of the states, there are family to family or family groups in all the states. And many of those are listed on the National Family Voices website. So that the kinds of resources that Nanfi were talking about are hopefully available to as many families who need them. Okay, we have had a great uh, set of panelists and I'm sorry we're not gonna be able to answer all of the questions which are excellent, but let me turn it over to Whitney who will just guide us through a couple of questions and make a couple of closing remarks. Whitney? Whitney, are you coming on? Yes, I'm trying. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Since we have less than five minutes, I think you maybe should just even summarize okay. if you want. Yeah, so we have one, um, uh, we've had, gosh, a, a lot of really great questions. Um, so one of them has to do with data um, and really whether or not we're collecting the right data to guide our current actions and inform policy decisions for the future. Um, and I, uh, Kay, if, if you wanted to tackle that question, that would that would be wonderful. Um, I, I think I think uh, Magda for the question and just want to say that um, it, it has to do with my calling for a robust response uh, in terms of measurement. I mean, it, the, there are the obvious levels. Every state should be um, collecting data by race, ethnicity and age. You saw what uh, Debbie Allen was able to show us for Los Angeles. There's no reason that every at the state level in every state and for all of our largest, particularly our 20 largest cities, they should be able to tell us those data. We just have to set the standard and call it. It's sort of this optional, well, if you can, well, if you feel like it kind of approach that we're doing right now. Uh, we have private institutions monitoring these data. And I think at the macro national level, that is helping us. Um, and again, one of the reasons that in our Title V ask, we are calling for um, additional support from maternal and child health epidemiology is exactly to get at some of the questions that have to do with pregnancy, pregnancy transmissions, complications, breastfeeding uh, issues for children, and just to bring that additional support to the macro level. If everybody's focused on counting who died in the hospital, then we're not going to get the numbers that we need um, in terms of the MCH population. And if we're just doing the macro um, non-specific data but, uh, that where we don't get age, race, and ethnicity, um, then we're not going to know what we need to know to go forward. And if this is going to last potentially for another 12 months of not having herd immunity and not having a vaccine, we need to have that real-time data in order to respond. And I think Debbie Allen gave an excellent example of why we need that. Great. Thank you so much. So we, we also have a, another um, really great question about uh, best strategies and lessons learned. So one question came in that asked about as a part of a national network of family-led organizations, were there opportunities to connect with and learn from colleagues in other states to learn about strategies, new partnerships, resources, or brainstorming ideas to address some of the very real issues of children uh, with special healthcare needs? 
and maybe Nanfi, you could you could uh, take this question. Um, yes. So you know, being being part of um, you know two national networks, Family Voices, Parent to Parent USA, and also being um, part of the Family to Family Health Information networks, um, which, are, which are nationwide. Um, Family Voices very quickly rallied all the um, F2Fs and F Family Voices in our states. And we started doing these weekly um, check-in calls to network with each other, to learn, because we're all dealing with all those complex things that every, all of the panelists have talked about, and figure out how we could um, then help our families. Um, so we did weekly calls. We talked about telehealth. We talked about, um, you know, everything that has been mentioned on this call. Um, and then we shared, um, we shared information. And um, if we needed something, you know, um, Family Voices was able to take that information um, and relate to um, MCHB. So mm -hmm. they could, um, they just, they, they would understand what the, the issues on the ground are. Mm -hmm. um, and we tried to bring in people to, um, you know, different presenters um, to help us to, um, to, to answer some of our questions. Um, so just having that national network was completely invaluable for many of us. Really key, key resource there. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of the, the, uh, the wonderful questions uh, that were posed um, today. I really want to thank uh, our panelists um, for their uh, outstanding uh, presentations and for their dedication to children, women, and families. Uh, just in, you know, some concluding uh, remarks and uh, reflections, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has underscored the lack of our country's protections for children, um, including access and quality of care, social protection systems, overcrowded housing and detention facilities, child care issues, and plans for schools. Um, and it really underscores the importance of the decisions that we make today are so critical. Um, it will not only lessen um, the immediate impact of the pandemic, but also the consequences over the long term. So again, I, I really want to thank our, our uh, panelists. I want to thank our participants. Many, many thanks to the College of Health team, in particular, uh, Jeannie Cassis, Sherry Booth, Jason, Jason Spiegel, Peggy Kane, and the entire College of Health faculty. Um, I do want to remind you that this session has been recorded and will be posted. Our next webinar uh, will be uh, on June 10th at 3 p.m. and will be hosted by Dr. Halcyon Skinner, who is the Associate Dean for Research and an Associate Professor in the College of Health. Once again, thank you so much for joining us and Thank you to our panelists for an excellent presentation, uh, very engaging and very, very important. Have a wonderful day, everyone. <laughs>